We have debt uh, deficit problems. There are ways to solve it. But one way is not to take health care away from people who need it. It's an injustice. We shouldn't permit it. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor. Senator from Alabama. Mr. President, I ask uh, for uh, unanimous consent that I address the Senate for eight minutes. Without objection. Mr. President, I rise today to once again if I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'll yield to the Senator. Uh, just uh, that uh, I ask uh, time until 4 p.m. be equally divided between the two leaders or their designees remaining with the, uh, with the other provisions of the previous order remaining in effect. And if my friend from Alabama will excuse me, that was the Without objection. Mr. President, I rise today to once again introduce my flat tax bill. The Smart, Manageable, and Responsible Tax Act, referred to as the SMART Act. In the United States, Mr. President, there are few, if any, days that are viewed with the same resentment and contempt year after year as April the 15th, National Tax Day, which happens to be, I believe, tomorrow. Our current tax code totals more than 70,000 pages, making tax compliance unnecessarily complex confusing and costly. During the past 10 years, there have been over 4,400 changes to the tax code, including an estimated 579 changes in 2010 alone, Mr. President. The inclusion of the additional 1099 tax reporting requirements in the health care reform bill are just one example of the onerous requirements throughout our tax code. As we've learned since the passage of these requirements last March, incremental improvements to the tax code are not easy. It took Congress over a year, Mr. President, to finally agree to repeal, as you'll recall, the 1099 changes that common sense tells us is essential to alleviating the burdens on small businesses. Yet, our tax code is riddled with other similarly ill-conceived requirements. Over the course of a year, individuals spend an average of 26 hours over half of a work week preparing for their tax filings. And although this has been standard practice for years, I do not believe average taxpayers should have to pour over IRS regulations for hours or pay someone to prepare their returns. Unfortunately, Mr. President, under our convoluted tax system, they're left with little choice. Approximately 60% of individual taxpayers now pay preparers to complete their taxes for them. An additional 29% of individuals use software to assist them with their filings. What this means for most people is that in addition to paying the government every year, they must pay someone to buy software to tell them exactly how much to pay the government. The American people, I believe, want and need fundamental tax reform that would save time and money and bring fairness to our tax structure. The legislation that I'm introducing today would implement much-needed reforms that eliminate onerous paperwork and promote economic growth in our country. The SMART tax code would repeal the current internal revenue tax code in its entirety and replace it with a single tax rate for all taxpayers of 17 percent on all salaries, wages, and pensions. The only exemptions would be a personal exemption of $13,410 for a single person, $17,120 for a head of a household, $26,810 for a married couple filing jointly, and $57.80, $5,780 for each dependent with these amounts indexed to inflation. Additionally, Mr. President, under my legislation, earnings from savings and investments would not be included in taxable income. Eliminating this double taxation would increase the savings rate in our country and immediately spur investments in the economy, create jobs, and boost economic growth. The SMART Act that we're talking about here also reforms our corporate tax code that's dire, direly needed. The United States currently has the second highest corporate tax rate in the world. 
American companies routinely make the difficult decision to move operations overseas to reduce their tax burden. Under my legislation, companies would pay a flat tax rate of 17% on their profits. Cutting the corporate tax rate in half would increase domestic companies' competitiveness with foreign corporations and eliminate the incentives to shift jobs overseas. This bill provides a simple, common-sense solution to the complexities and inequities of the current tax system that we live under. The taxpayers would be able to determine their tax liability quickly and easily and file a tax return the size of a postcard. I've said a number of times here in the Senate that before that our current, that our current system is very unfair. It punishes success and stifles economic growth. And I believe the best remedy is to adopt a single tax rate for all taxpayers. Transitioning, Mr. President, to a flat tax would not only increase fairness in the tax code, it would also increase the incentives to work and invest and create jobs. By eliminating the thousands of tax loopholes, deductions, and credits that can often only be utilized with extensive tax planning and expensive advisors, Hard work in Americans can rest assured that corporations with billions of dollars in profit and sophisticated taxpayers are not able to unfairly reduce or eliminate their tax liabilities and leave middle class Americans paying the bill. Mr. President, I recognize that this bill is a monumental shift away from our current tax laws. I believe that's what we need. But our economy needs a boost, and we must not allow the enormity of the task to deter us from enacting better, more efficient tax laws. I urge my colleagues to join me in support of this legislation. I thank the chair and I yield the floor. Senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'd like to um, ask the next 15 minutes for Senator Vitter and I to have the opportunity to introduce a very important piece of legislation, Mr. President. Objection. Thank you. I'm going to speak just for two or three minutes in a brief introduction and then turn it over to my colleague uh, from Louisiana. Uh, and we are both uh, very excited and enthusiastic to present to the Senate and to Congress work that we've really been, uh, work that's been underway uh, for almost a year. Um, Mr. President, as you know, next week on April 20th, uh, we will be marking the one-year anniversary of the Deepwater Horizon explosion, which killed 11 men. They are still in our thoughts and prayers and their families to this day, injured dozens of others, and shocked millions with the explosion that occurred a year ago next Wednesday. There are many steps that our nation has to take and must take to respond to that horrific incident, and Senator Vitter and I are on the floor today to introduce the Restore the Gulf Coast Act of 2011, which we believe is one of the most important things that needs to be done in response to this incident, and is frankly, Mr. President, long overdue even before this tragedy happened, and I'll briefly explain. This Gulf Coast is a very important coast of America. I know that all of our coasts believe, and it's true, they're all important, but we that live on the Gulf Coast are particularly proud of the coast of Texas and Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida, because on this coast, not only do we have the natural and normal port and maritime activities, which is true of every coast, we also support the nation in hosting a very important domestic oil and gas industry, which is primarily offshore, but a great deal onshore, both close and on our marshes. In addition, we have a very vibrant and robust fish, both commercial and recreational. We have ecotourism. Very bird routes from the south going north, obviously. Lee, this is a highway for migratory birds and extremely important to wildlife enthusiasts and hunters and fishermen. And may I also add, and not let us forget, the tourism industry. So we say proudly in the Gulf Coast, we are America's working coast. We seek a balance between 
mining and exploring for our, and using our natural resources and balancing that so that this coast can be sustainable. Mr. President, this is a great opportunity for the nation to do right by the Gulf Coast. It's a great opportunity for the polluters to step up and do the right thing. It's a great opportunity to give a break to taxpayers because the bill that Senator Vitter and I are putting forward, and we hope our other colleagues will join us, will basically say that the fine that BP is going to pay, and maybe other contractors as well, that 80 percent, actually 100 percent of that fine should go, and at least 80 percent of that fine should go to this area where the injury occurred. I'm just going to take the next minute to put up this horrifying picture that people will remember because a year ago, this is what the site looked like when the Deepwater Horizon exploded and five million barrels of oil escaped from this tragedy and marred the beaches and marshes and oceans and were still recovering and will for years. But because of the five million approximate barrels that were spilled, this polluter, BP, and its contractors are going to have to pay a very serious fine to the federal government. We believe that that fine is best directed to help the environment which was injured and to get the taxpayers off the hook and put the polluters on the hook for picking up this tab and to do so in a way that's fair to the Gulf Coast states, and that is what Senator Vitter will speak about in more detail. Let me just show you one picture happily. Today, the beaches along the Gulf Coast in large measure, and in large measure, look like this. This is the way they normally look, because not only do we drill for oil and gas off of our waters, but our children swim in this water. We recreate and have picnics along the beach. This is the way we'd like this beach to look for decades to come. And if we're successful in getting our bill uh, passed through the Congress and signed by the President in the near future, this is possible, along with pictures like this, which represent a great and proud industry, the shrimping industry in the Gulf Coast, which supplies fresh seafood for restaurants all over our nation and, in some cases, the world. So at this point, let me turn it to Senator Vitter for some more detail, and I want to just say it's been a pleasure, and I really thank him for his support. We want this to be a bipartisan effort. Both the industry and the environmental groups are very interested in working with us on this, and we think it's the right policy, Mr. President, for our country. Senator Vitter. Mr. President, I'm proud to join my colleague, Senator Landrieu, in introducing today this Restore the Gulf Coast Act of 2011. And I want to also thank her and compliment her on her leadership on the issue. Uh, Mary's been developing this legislation tirelessly since the tragedy, working with many others who will soon be co-sponsors, we hope, in this effort. Also want to recognize Congressman Steve Scalise and his Louisiana House colleagues for having similar legislation in the House. Now, Mr. President, as we near this one-year anniversary of the disaster, First, we need to remember the victims, the human victims. Eleven people lost their lives and their families. Those families still have a, a huge hole in their lives, and we need to continue to remember them and pray for them. But we also need to help restore the affected area. A lot of other lives were impacted through the environmental and the economic devastation, and we need to work on that as well. This Restore the Gulf Coast Act of 2011 would go a long way in restoring those lives, in healing those impacts. This was a horrible tragedy, and of course, the physical, the environmental damage was borne by these five Gulf Coast states. So therefore, we think it is more than fair that 80 percent of the fines directly related to this event which would not have been incurred, would not be in existence but for this tragedy, be dedicated to restoration along the Gulf Coast. Sir and Landrieu, with my support and others, have worked out a very fair formula 
to impact all of the Gulf Coast states in a positive way. We think it's more than fair because it assures some minimum funding to all of the affected states and then uh, has another pot of money that is specifically focused on direct impacts. And we think this is a very fair way to go about it that also dovetails with the work that's been going on in the states and federally uh, through the President's Commission on Impacts. And so we think this would be an excellent way to approach it. And it is more than fair to the federal government and to the federal taxpayer because the money retained that's still flowing to the federal treasury more than covers uh, all expenses of the federal government related to this event goes well beyond those direct expenses. So again, Mr. President, I thank my colleague for her leadership, and I ask all of our colleagues to come together around this effort. This concept has been explicitly endorsed by President Obama. This concept has been explicitly endorsed by the President's commission in the oil spill. All of those folks have absolutely said yes, 80% of these Clean Water Act fines need to stay on the Gulf Coast for much needed restoration. This legislation will get that done in a fair, straightforward way. I urge all of my colleagues to support it and help pass it in the next few weeks and months. Thank you, Mr. President. With that, I turn the floor back to my colleague from Louisiana. Mr. President. Senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. President. I see other colleagues on the floor waiting to speak, so I'll try to wrap up uh, these remarks in just about five minutes, but I do want to add a few things and thank my colleague again. He's going to be, and he is on the committee that will uh, take this bill under consideration. That committee is chaired by Senator Barbara Boxer, and I want to thank her, uh, our colleague from California, the chair of the EPW committee, uh, and her staff that have been working with us very, very closely over the last uh, year as we fashioned this approach. And I think uh, the senator, of course, will speak for herself, but I think it's in her philosophy that the polluter should pay, not the taxpayer, and that the area that was injured should be the area that receives the response and that the environment that was injured here should step up and be first um, uh, uh, attended to, and that is the essence and nature of, of, our, of our bill. But just to put a couple of other things in the record, uh, Senator Vitter mentioned this, but it's worth repeating. President Obama has already endorsed this general concept, and I want to thank him for his early leadership uh, on this and his administration. The Oil Spill Commission. Uh, which I had some real, I'll have to say, reservations about in the early stages of the makeup of that commission. I honestly didn't think that there were enough people representing the industry perspective, only the environmental perspective. I was happy to see that that commission report came out fairly balanced, and both Bob Graham, who was a former colleague of ours from uh, Florida, and Bill Riley, the former EPA director under President uh, Bush, came to the same conclusion that one of the best ways to spend this fine money would be restoring a very important coastal area, not just for the Gulf Coast, but for the nation, and frankly, the world, and to try to find a path forward for coastal communities to have sustainable economies. This is an important question, Mr. President, not just for the Gulf Coast, not just for the East Coast, not just for the West Coast, but I might say this might be one of the great questions in the world today. Since 60% of the population or more of the world, of the planet, live near coastlines, the question of how can people live there productively, safely, and how can that environment sustain them in that growth and development is a really important question to get answers to. And let me say, as a resident of the Gulf Coast, we don't have enough answers. We don't have enough money to ask questions. That's what this money will go for, some science and technology, some basic research, and most importantly, some money to restore and use the science we do have 
right now, even though we don't have enough, to do the right things by this environment. So I want to recognize those entities and, might I say, Secretary Mabus, who former um, uh, Secretary, well, current Secretary of the Navy, took a leave uh, or added to his portfolio to come and run this commission. And he, too, arrived at the same conclusion that a very excellent and smart way to spend some of these fine monies would be on these programs. Just a couple of minutes more to put some facts into the record. And other senators from other states, Florida, Texas, Mississippi, and Alabama, can enter their own data. But I just think it's important for people to understand when we talk about the coast of Louisiana. And Tanner, let's put this back up. Just the coast of Louisiana, this is going to be hard for people to believe, but it is actually true. <laughs> the tidal miles, if you count the tidal miles of Louisiana, which is about 7,000 tidal miles from the tip here all the way over to Texas, from our Mississippi border, 7,000 miles, if you stretched that out, it's the same as going from Miami to Seattle. Now, I just need people to get that in their mind. Um, I know this looks like a little shore because it's not a big shore like California or New Jersey or whatever, Florida. But the, the nature of this shore, because it's not just a beach, it's America's greatest wetlands and marsh. If you stretched it out in all the inlets and bays and estuaries, it would go from Miami to Seattle. This area is threatened and has been for years. Yes, the oil and gas industry, unfortunately, has contributed to some of its damage. But it's also because the Mississippi River flows through here, and it's been dammed and tamed as best as men and women can try to tame natural things. And the hydraulics have changed. Sea level has risen. And this area is under great threat. We lose 1,500 square miles have been lost since 1930. 25 square miles of wetlands each year, which means a football field every 30 seconds. This is an urgent matter. There is no loss of land anywhere in the continental United States that has this amount of threat to this coast. We have struggled for years to find a revenue stream to help fix it. We understand the rest of the country says, why should we fix it? It's not our coast. But what we say back is, this coast is important to the whole nation. It drains 40% of the continent. It's the greatest river system in North America. No one can get wheat out of Kansas or Iowa without coming through this Mississippi River. So there is an interest. 17% of the GDP is basically um, supported and created by this Gulf Coast economy. But we're also, Mr. President, willing to pay our own way as well. Our parishes have taxed themselves. The state has set up a constitutional um, safeguard, lockbox. If we'd only done that for Social Security, Mr. President, you would be happy. We've done a lockbox for the wetlands money that comes in, so it can only be used for that purpose. So we're very proud of the actions that our local have, have, locals have taken. Now it's time for the federal government to act. A few more statistics, and I'll end. 30% of the commercial fisheries in the United States comes off of this coast. And um, 1.7 billion in economic impact from recreational fishing. And again, over 50% of the domestic oil and gas, because we drill for oil and gas here that keep lights on and electricity in chambers like this in rooms and buildings all over our country. So that's why this is so uh, important. I'm going to add some other statistics uh, to the record uh, about um, some of the economic impacts of this coast. But again, this is an important coast to the country, and it's an important effort for the world, for us in America to get this right. Just think about the drilling that's occurring off the coast of Africa or Brazil or Australia or Israel, 
And what happens? You know, let's prevent any explosions. Let's prevent these disasters. And we're struggling to do that. And the record is pretty good, despite uh, the criticism that comes. And that's a speech for another day. But the question is, when there's an accident, when this happens, how do you take that penalty money and invest it in the coast so that it's more resilient and it will really benefit people in every way over a long period of time in a very balanced fashion. I would only conclude by urging my colleagues along the Gulf Coast from Florida to Alabama to Mississippi and Texas, Republicans and Democrats alike, the members of the House as well, to step forward and join Senator Vitter and I. We're open to ideas and thoughts about how the money should be allocated, but within general sets of principles that we have outlined today. And I want to again thank Senator Boxer, whose committee will consider this in the very near future. We're hoping for a hearing in the very near future and then a markup on this bill to move it forward to the President's desk. So again, Mr. President, thank you. And I see other colleagues on the floor, and I'll uh, relinquish the floor. Mr. President. Senator from New Jersey. Mr. President, uh, shortly we hopefully will be voting on a budget agreement for this fiscal year, and that will start the, the process of uh, the debate on the next fiscal year. And what we are about to do is more than pass a budget agreement. We are about to define a vision of America. We are about to make choices now and in the coming weeks that will reflect our values and our principles as a people and as a nation. And the real question before us in my mind is not simply about the numbers. It is about competing visions of America. Whether or not we choose a vision of America where the air and water are clean, where food and prescription drugs are safe, where roads and bridges and transportation systems are modern, well maintained and fuel prosperity for the future. An America that puts a premium on education and invests in jobs and the middle class. An America where a mother who wakes up in the middle of the night with a sick child doesn't have to wonder if she can afford to take that child to the doctor or if her insurance will cover the costs. An America in which seniors have a reliable Medicare system they can count on not just a voucher that doesn't even cover the cost of a plan in the private marketplace. That's an ugly vision of America that we have seen before, and it's why we passed Medicare in the first place. Let's be clear. This is not about the numbers. This is not just simply about the details of deficit reduction. This is about two competing views of this nation, one in which we embrace the concept of community, each of us working together for the betterment of all of us, all of us sharing in the burden of balancing the budget and reducing the deficit. The other is a Tea Party vision in which no government is good government and the notion of an American community is a myth and that we are simply a nation of competing individuals, each of us working for what we can get on our own. Tea Partiers see an America in which the burden of balancing the budget should be borne by senior citizens, students, middle class families, while protecting subsidies to big oil companies and giving even more tax breaks to the wealthiest Americans. We see an America of shared prosperity and shared responsibility that reduces the deficit, balances its budget, knowing that millionaires and billionaires can be just as patriotic and willing to pay their fair share as a soldier in Afghanistan whose family is living on an army paycheck. Mr. President, our friends on the other side tell us that tax cuts for millionaires and billionaires create jobs and benefit middle class families. They told us that when we passed the Bush tax cuts a little over a decade ago that it would create millions of jobs for average Americans and what happened? Jobs were eliminated or sent overseas, and the wage gap increased. This tax policy may benefit some, but it doesn't create jobs and it doesn't reduce our deficit. For 
For some reason, we seem to think that the wealthiest Americans are clamoring for more tax cuts, but I find no basis in fact for that. I've spoken to many CEOs and leading corporate executives in my state and around the country, and never have I heard a word about how badly they need another tax cut. And I believe the wealthiest Americans are as patriotic as any one of us and are willing to step up to the plate and pay their fair share if we simply ask them to support a rational tax reform program that emphasizes shared fiscal responsibility and shared prosperity. In my view, tax cuts for millionaires are nothing more than a political sleight of hand a smoke and mirrors vision of America in which there is no shared responsibility, no sense of community, but a misguided belief that only if the rich had more money, the elderly, the sick, the poor, the middle class family struggling to make ends meet, the disabled child on Medicaid who needs round the clock care would somehow be better off. We've been there before and it hasn't worked. It's a smoke and mirror visions of America to believe that if there were no environmental protections that polluters would protect our air and keep the water clean and safe because it's the right thing to do. Again, we've seen that vision of America and it came in a poisonous cloud of smog that lingered over America's cities, which is why Richard Nixon, a Republican president, created the Environmental Protection Agency in the first place. And if we're serious about reducing the deficit, we at least should be looking, for example, at subsidies for big oil. The top five oil companies earned nearly a trillion dollars, trillion dollars over the last decade. Passing my bill to repeal oil subsidies would save taxpayers $33 billion over the next 10 years. And we can safely assume oil profits will be much greater in the decade to come with higher oil prices. But let's assume that the top five oil companies only get another trillion dollars in profits over the next decade. Taking back 33 billion in government handouts would only shave about 3% of those profits. And let's not forget that much of these profits are in federal waters and on federal lands, so they're making these profits on America's own soil. If we were serious about reducing the deficit, we'd also be seriously looking, for example, at big oil subsidies and tax breaks. According to the data, the cost of exploration, development, production of oil and natural gas in the United States averaged about $33.76 per barrel of oil. Oil is trading at $107 a barrel. That means big oil companies are enjoying a profit of over $70 per barrel of oil they extract. Why in the world would they ever need subsidies from the United States taxpayer in such conditions? No, handing out money and reducing regulatory burdens on big oil companies and on the wealthiest Americans is not about balancing the budget or reducing the deficit. It is about a vision of America that favors the rich and would rather dismantle Medicare, cut Social Security, cut Medicaid for seniors, and the poorest among us in nursing homes who have no other place to go rather than to solve our long-term deficit problems. I am deeply disturbed at what's being proposed as we move forward in the next debate of the next fiscal year and the so-called push for balancing the budget by shifting four trillion dollars from the promise of America to protect this nation and to create prosperity for its people to the wealthiest Americans in a tax cut that actually does absolutely nothing to solve the deficit problem. I am disturbed when I see those on the other side lining up to resist any compromise, any effort for a reasonable chance at a workable solution. Before the President was even done speaking yesterday, the Tea Party and many Republicans had already made up their mind that there was nothing to talk about, no room for compromise that there is no other view than their own. When I first arrived in the other body, Mr. President, we may have had very clear and fundamental differences, but we understood that we were there to govern. Now our Republican colleagues seem to have stopped governing in order to score political points and hope they can win an election. The extreme wing of the Republican Party 
is driving the legislative process and the Republican Party to the darkest reaches of the political spectrum, fundamentally threatening the very notion of democracy. They want what they want, and they want it all. They will accept nothing less than everything, but let's not forget that it was Republican policies that got us here in the first place. It wasn't long ago, not long after the last Republican government shutdown during another Democratic administration when we had budget surpluses, surpluses as far as the eye could see. The day Bill Clinton left office, he handed President Bush a $236 billion surplus with a projected surplus of $5.6 trillion over the next 10 years. When the Bush administration left office and President Obama was sworn in after eight years of Republican economic policies that they are espousing again, tax cuts to the wealthiest, two wars waged unpaid for, turning a blind eye to the excesses of Wall Street, the new president faced an economy that was at the abyss of a new depression. The Republicans had turned a $236 billion budget surplus into a $1.3 trillion budget deficit and projected shortfalls of $8 trillion over the next decade. Now they want to give more tax cuts to millionaires and billionaires. Losing $700 billion on the revenue side over the next 10 years by extending the Bush tax cuts and trillions more by slashing tax rates for corporations and millionaires without, without offsetting tax expenditures. Those making more than a million dollars a year would see tax cuts of $125,000 each from the tax cuts and tens of thousands of dollars more from the proposed tax rates. While people in my state would lose $34 billion in health benefits and 400,000 New Jerseyans end up without health coverage at all. They want to shift the balance to millionaires and billionaires while making draconian cuts to make up for the deficits they created. Cuts do not reflect our values as a people and as a nation. So let me conclude, Mr. President, by saying we all agree that we must do more to rein in spending and get back to the kind of surpluses Democrats created in the 1990s. But we can only get there through a reasonable framework that emphasizes shared prosperity and shared fiscal responsibility to achieve our common goal. The way we get there is through negotiation and compromise not through smoke and mirrors, not through trickle-down theories that have not worked, and strictly adhering to an ideological political agenda that fundamentally starts the clock all over again on the battles for basic American protections that were fought and won in the last century. Let's not go back. Let's protect American values and keep America moving forward and working. As I've said, you show me your budget, and I'll show you your values. Mr. President, the Republican vision of this nation as defined in H.R. 1, does not represent this senator's values. It is not the fulfillment of the American promise, idea, and ideal. And I do not believe it is who we are as a people and what we want our nation to represent to the world. Mr. President, with that, I yield the floor. Mr. President, Senator from Kentucky. You know, it's amazing to me to be lectured to and to hear about how awful the Tea Party is and what the Tea Party represents from folks who have never been to a Tea Party. You know, come on down to a Tea Party. Bring your Huey Long rhetoric, a chicken in every pot, a windmill in every background, a windmill in every backyard. Bring it on down to the Tea Party. Let's have a discussion. Bring it out to the American public. We hear from those who want to lecture the Tea Party about cutting spending. Who among these folks has voted against an appropriations bill? We haven't even seen an appropriations bill in this body in over a year. We didn't see a budget. We're spending $2 trillion we don't have, and they're here blaming it on the Tea Party. Who's in charge here? It's not the Tea Party. Blame it on us. Give us an appropriations bill. Give us a budget. Do something constructive to fix the fiscal problems we have up here. They say that compromise is the ideal. They tell the Tea Party you need to compromise. But you know what the compromise is? They want to raise your taxes. 
The Debt Commission wants to raise your taxes. The President wants to raise your taxes. That's what they're talking about. The President yesterday said he's going to cut $4 trillion. Well, try to read what's going on here. He said he was going to spend $46 trillion a month ago, his budget. Before we've even had a discussion of his budget, he's going to cut $4 trillion off the $46 trillion he's going to spend. These are no cuts. We will spend more this year than we spent last year. Forget about all the numbers. Forget about all the baselines. Forget about 6, 60, 30, 78, or zero, which is what the CBO scored this yesterday. Zero in cuts. Forget all about it and ask your representatives, are we going to spend more this year than last year? If we're spending more this year than last year, that's not a cut. Ask your representatives, ask your senators, will the deficit be more this year than last year? The deficit will be bigger this year. We threatened to shut down government over nothing because we're not cutting spending in any serious way. They want to blame it on the Tea Party because in their secret caucus meetings, they've done a poll that says oh, the Tea Party could be the villain. Call them extreme. Call them all Tea Partiers. Say the Tea Party has taken over the Republican Party. Well, you know what the Tea Party believes in? Good government. We believe in balancing the budget. We believe in reducing spending. We have plans to fix Social Security. We, we introduced a plan yesterday. If the other side is serious about fixing the entitlements, we have a plan. Come to us and work with us. But don't just come down here and call us names. Before you send any more money to Washington, ask your representatives, are they spending your money wisely? A hundred billion dollars in the budget last year is unaccounted for. We don't know where it was spent or we think it was improperly spent. A hundred billion dollars. In our senatorial offices, we get several million dollars. Some of us want to be frugal with that and send some back to the Treasury. We plan on sending several hundred thousand dollars back. But you know what? We want to know where the money goes. We're still not certain. We've been asking for four months. Some people say that money is kept in some fund for three years and then may go back. Other people have told us the leadership spends that money. We don't have a definitive answer for even trying to save a couple hundred thousand dollars of your money that I have control over. Now, the Pentagon spends a lot of money. Some people say we can never cut any, but are they spending their money wisely? Well, you don't know because we can't audit them. Why can't we audit them? The Pentagon tells us they are too big to audit. You heard about the company saying they're too big to fail. The government tells you now they're too big to be audited. We got a partial audit of the Federal Reserve. We got some information from that. Guess what? We're now fighting a war against Gaddafi. You know what we were doing last month? We were giving him money. We give him foreign aid. Not much, but we give him some. We also help to bail out his national bank. Well, in these third world countries, the National Bank is the leader's piggy bank. We don't know who owns it or where the money goes. Half of it's probably spirited off to secret accounts in Switzerland. But the U.S. taxpayer bailed out Qaddafi's bank. Now we're bombing him. The budget bill that we're talking about has now been scored by the CBO and will cut almost nothing, maybe a couple hundred million dollars. It will increase defense spending by $8 billion and it will cut spending by $8 billion. The net is about zero. Our deficit this year will be bigger than last year. Our overall spending will be bigger this year than last year. We are not yet serious in Washington. We have not yet here recognized the severity, the enormity, and the significance of how big this deficit is. This deficit is going to have serious repercussions. The Chinese have bought over a trillion dollars of our debt. The Japanese, nearly a trillion. The Japanese now have suffered an enormous national disaster. Question is, will they continue to buy our debt or can they continue to buy our debt? The other question is, how long can a government continue to exist that spends more than it brings in? Now, on the other side, they want to blame the Tea Party or the Republicans or rich people. You know what? Both parties are responsible. Republicans, Democrats, senators, congressmen, president, everyone up here is responsible. It's not one party or the other. When Republicans were in charge, they ran up the deficit. Now that Democrats are in charge, the main difference, they're doing it faster. 
But the Republicans weren't doing a very good job either during our time in power. We have to understand that the people can do things. Not everything has to be done up here. The states can do things. We have to believe once again in the American dream. Believing in the American dream is not standing here on the floor and castigating rich people. What's great about our country is that any among us, any of our kids, any among us could become rich people. Work hard, go to school, achieve. We live in a mobile society, and that's what the American dream is about. We got away from Europe because all the land was owned, and it was stifled by nobility. We came here where there was plenty of land and plenty of opportunity, and the American dream is, is believing in that. The interesting thing is when they try to soak the rich, this old Huey Long stuff, when they try this, it's actually failing with the American people because many of us believe that our kids could gain great wealth or could gain great success. We still believe in the American dream. So if they want to castigate that and want to say, forget about it, what we need is just more government, they need to explain to people why they don't believe in capitalism, why they don't believe in the American dream, why they don't believe in the greatness of America. I still believe in America. I want to get government out of the way but I think we cannot have an America that succeeds until we're able to do something about our debt crisis. I fear that no one up here, or very few up here, on either side recognizes the severity and imminence of this problem. And my hope is that before a crisis occurs in our country, we will begin to seriously discuss balancing our budget, have plans to balance our budget, and seriously cut spending. Thank you, Mr. President. I see you back my time. Mr. President. Senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I understand there are other colleagues on the floor, but I would like to speak for just a few minutes as chair of the Homeland Security Appropriations Committee and give a few views about the vote that we're going to cast in a few hours relative to that committee. But before I do, to my good colleague uh, from uh, Kentucky, Senator Paul, uh, it's going to be a very uh, lively and exciting debate, but I would just uh, say respectfully that to a hungry family, a chicken in the pot looks pretty good every now and then, and that there are millions of children literally and sadly in this country today that go home from school and open the refrigerator or look on the stove and they can't find a drumstick anywhere. And that's what this debate is. Number two about number two I think it's great, and I used to love to hear President Clinton say that one of our jobs here was to create more millionaires. I belong to the DLC, and I'm proud of it, the Democratic Leadership Council. We believe in creating opportunity that comes along with responsibility and create paths forward to prosperity. But most people that I represent, including Tea Party people, don't believe that companies like GE, one of the biggest companies in the world, should get away with paying no taxes. I, I guess the senator from Kentucky thinks that's a good idea. We don't. And I also think that most people I represent, including the Tea Party, think that people that make over a million dollars a year, not millionaires, not people that make 250000 a year, but people that make over a million dollars a year might, could pay a little more so that we could afford either early childhood education or early health care in an effective and efficient way because people know, Tea Party people and other people, what a smart investment that is. So this is going to be a very interesting debate. Um, and I look forward to it. But the reason I came to the floor was to actually give a statement on Homeland Security, and I'll just take a few minutes to do so. Um, for the last several weeks, the press world about the possibility of a government shutdown. Happily, because of compromise and reasonable heads, we prevented uh, that shutdown. We've still got an awful lot of work to do. Uh, a lot of attention was about who would be blamed if that happened. I think um, far too little was focused on the consequences of the funding cuts that were originally proposed by uh, the Senator's colleagues from the House, led by the more radical wing of the Republican Party, and I'd like to talk 
about that now. Some officials in Washington uh, were busy slashing budgets while terrorists continue to seek ways to harm this nation. I can most certainly assure you, Mr. President, that terrorists do not care about spending top lines, about chimps, about cuts, and about compromise. Terrorists are care about finding our vulnerabilities and exploiting them to do harm to Americans, to target our military, and to damage our economy. In the State of the Union earlier this year, the President stated that Al-Qaeda and its affiliates continue to plan to attack us. He is stating the truth. He stressed that extremists are trying to inspire acts of violence by those already within our borders. According to our Attorney General, in the last two years, 126 individuals have been indicted for terrorist-related activities, including 50 U.S. citizens. Homeland Security Napolitano Secretary has said that the threat of terrorist attack is as high as it's been since 9-11. That's very sobering. We know this because recent events that we see and read about tell us that, even if you're not in the classified briefings that many of us are as part of our job. We know the Fort Hood shooting happened at the hands of a U.S. citizen. We know the New York subway bombing attempt happened at the hands of a legal resident alien. The Times Square bombing attempt happened precipitated by a naturalized citizen, but we also continue to face threats from abroad. The 2009 Christmas Day bombing attempt, the 2010 air cargo event, or just two, and every day, daily cyber attacks get increasingly sophisticated, alarming, and come from countries and hackers that want to shut our economy or parts of it down and do violence. And let me also mention the violence in Mexico at our southern border. Now, this isn't just about scare and fund, but I have to say these are true things that are happening, true threats to our nation, and the Homeland Security budget is the citizens and the taxpayers' protection against these things happening. And so when we talk about the Homeland Security budget, to my good friend from Kentucky and others that are going to be debating this, this isn't just about campaign slogans and focus groups about what might sound right in tea parties or other places around the country. These budget line ide lines and items have serious consequences to whether a terrorist, terrorist will get through our line of defense whether the machines that we purchased are the best on the market, whether they work, whether our human intelligence has been trained appropriately. These are serious issues. And as chair of this committee, I can tell you I'm voting for this bill today. We had a 2% cut. Doesn't sound like a lot. But I'm going to list for the record the things that we lost in these negotiations so people understand what's at risk as we go forward. In addition to these threats, we have Homeland Security must prepare for natural disasters. And I'm going to submit something to the record because I don't want to take too much time. I will summarize by saying this, because this is partly the Republican leadership's fault and partly President Obama's fault. Neither side, neither one of them, <laughs> thinks that it's a good idea um, to use emergency money for real emergencies. Now, you can't use emergency money for real emergencies. I don't know what you'd use emergency money for. And both in the President's proposal and in the Republican leadership, they're expecting me as the chairman and my committee to have to kind of guess what's going to happen in the future by way of disasters and then take it out of the base Homeland Security budget and just pray that I'm right. If they continue to make me do that, I'm going to have to go find a crystal ball and I'm going to put it on my desk because that's what I'm going to have to use to do this budget and that would be ridiculous. So my point is this, I will take a billion eight, which is the average of disasters and put in this base budget and use the rest for Coast Guard, ICE, etc. I will not jeopardize the Homeland Security budget because of some ideological, philosophical foolishness that expects a chairman in my committee to predict in advance what disasters will happen, in advance how much they will cost, and put that in my budget.
That will not happen. In addition, um, on a bipartisan basis, I want to say we have the happy part of this, if there is any happy part, we have funded some parts of the catastrophic disaster. We've averted some of the more serious cuts by some uh, good work that we did uh, in these negotiations. Uh, and we eliminated some of the more harmful cuts that would have uh, happened to the Coast Guard, to Customs, to Border Protection, and Immigration Enforcement, and Transportation and Security. I'm going to submit the rest of this, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the record. But I want to say in conclusion, this is going to be probably one of the most important debates that takes place not only on the floor of the Senate, but in our, um, our, our, colleagues, uh, with our colleagues in the House over the next couple of months about the path and the direction of this country and our values and our morals and our principles. And who is going to share? Are we going to share the burden? Or is this burden going to be completely put on the shoulders of the poor, of children, and of the middle class families in this country? America is too great for that. I believe we'll find a way. I look forward to debating this with my colleague. And again, since I represent quite a few, unfortunately, hungry children, let me just say that I'm sure that a chicken, whether it's fried, grilled, or barbecued, looks pretty good to them when they come home from school. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Okay. The Senator from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, we have a, a vote today on a measure to continue uh, spending for the federal government for the next couple of months, and it amounts to nearly $40 billion in cuts. And I think that's a good start. I think most Americans would agree with that. But it is only a start. And we should now work together across party lines to bring down our long-term debt in a responsible way that protects middle-income families and, of course, as well, the most vulnerable in society. So we do have substantial cuts in this, uh, this bill today. In fact, they're record cuts for uh, what we know as discretionary funding. At the same time, though, we have to get uh, down to the more difficult business of reducing deficit and debt, and that work is ahead of us. As we do that, we've got to make sure that we're protecting uh, middle-income families and those who are vulnerable. So this is a good start, but we should remember what families are going through right now. Families all across America whose uh, one member of that family or sometimes more have lost their job. In Pennsylvania, for example, we have over 500,000 people out of work. Fortunately, that number has come down since last summer. Last summer, it was approaching 600,000. Now it's uh, about 511,000. But we need to bring that number down. And as families are making decisions, they have to make some difficult choices, especially those who lost a job or a home or sometimes both, but even families that aren't living through the horrific crisis of unemployment and job loss, even families uh, where one or two members of that family are working, those families as well have to make difficult choices. And that's the way we should approach this as a family, or at least to do our best to imitate what families have to do every day of the week and to make those difficult choices. But we're facing a deficit and debt uh, set of facts and a challenge that we've never faced in the nation's history. And we've got to be responsive to that. I spent a decade in state government in Pennsylvania as the Auditor General of the state, and then my last two years in that decade as the state treasurer. I know a lot about cutting waste and fraud and abuse, how to locate it, identify it, how to cut it out, and how to make change. That's why I was so heartened by what I saw in a GAO report last month. On March 1st, the GAO released a report entitled opportunities to reduce potential duplication in government programs, save tax dollars, and enhance revenue. That's the name of the report. It should serve as a one measure, but it should serve as a how-to guide to reducing waste, fraud, and abuse in government. It's all there. And here's, what, here's some of the highlights. The GAO report identified numerous areas of the federal budget where unnecessary duplication, overlap, or fragmentation exists. By some estimates, addressing these redundancies 
uh, could save more than $100 billion, and potentially as much as $200 billion. It's not going to reduce the deficit uh, by as much as we need to reduce it, but that as well is a very good start, a good place to look. So we need to take a hard look at reports like that and take action. I voted to support an amendment last week that would require the Office of Management and Budget to immediately cut at least $5 billion in wasteful and duplicative uh, spending in government programs. And I was happy to see that pass the Senate. So this is a, another step, a first step, and a good start in addition to what we're doing today by cutting almost uh, $40 billion. But we've got to cut spending in a way that's smart. We've got to cut spending in a way that's smart enough to realize that those decisions have to contribute to economic growth to keep the, the economy of a state like Pennsylvania and a country like America growing. We've got to continue to grow as we cut, and we have to continue to create jobs as we cut. We can't do one and not the other. The federal budget, I think, should also reflect our not just our national priorities, but our values as well. And this holds true in the uh, budget we're about to debate, the 2012 budget. Unfortunately, though, what uh, Republican members in the House have proposed for the upcoming fiscal year puts the entire burden of reducing the deficit on older citizens, students, and middle-income families. That doesn't sound like a family to me. That doesn't sound like working together, coming together, uh, on a plan, everyone trying to, to sacrifice, everyone trying to pitch in. It sounds like they're placing the burden on members of the family that should not bear the whole burden. The Republican plan would end Medicare as we know it. It's as simple as that. It would end Medicare as we know it. In Pennsylvania, that means 2.2 million people who are, who are Medicare beneficiaries would be directly and adversely uh, impacted. These aren't just numbers and statistics. It happens to be 2.2 million people, but who are they? They're people who fought our wars. They're people who worked in our factories. They're people who built this economy over many generations. They're people who took care of our children, taught our children, cared for our children. These are people who gave all of us life and love. And we're going to come in with a, a, a Medicare scheme to just put the burden on them and say that we've done deficit reduction? I don't think that's what a family does, and I don't think that's uh, what America has done or will ever do. We worked hard to reduce uh, out-of-pocket costs for beneficiaries under the Affordable Care Act, and the Republican House plan will double, double out-of-pocket expenses according to the Congressional Budget Office. The Republican plan does nothing to reduce health costs or reform the health care delivery system. It does nothing at all to do that. What it does is shift costs to older citizens and people with disabilities. The GOP plan in the, in the House targets health care spending. Here's what it does. It cuts 700, over $770 billion out of Medicaid by conver converting it to a block grant program. What does that mean? Well, it means that those who are supposed to be able to rely upon the good services provided in, in Medicaid have to shoulder uh, the burden. Medicaid provides health care to the most vulnerable people in our society. Older citizens living in nursing homes, uh, in, many, in many instances, millions of them rely upon Medicaid, not always just Medicare. Children. Tens of millions, I think the number now, right now is about 27 million to be exact. 27 million children rely upon uh, Medicaid. People with disabilities. So as we look to reform our budget and to reduce deficit and debt as we must, we shouldn't take steps that will harm children uh, by some of the proposals that we see for Medicaid. About one-third of rural children in America, about one-third of rural children are beneficiaries of Medicaid or the, or the Children's Health Insurance Program. We should remember that when we're thinking about what Medicaid is. By every measure, Medicaid is both cost-effective and an essential lifeline for our children. Many people know about the early periodic screening and diagnosis and treatment 
um, provisions within, within Medicaid. It's the gold standard for how poor children get their health care. And thank goodness we've had that in place all these decades. But we have people now that want to eliminate that basic gold standard of health care. So we have a long way to go. We've got a lot of work to do. We have much work to do on deficit and debt, and we have to get to that. And we still have to reduce spending. We did re reduce it by a record amount in the, uh, the bill we're voting on today. But as we do this, just as families have to come together and share burdens and cut costs, we've got to remember that our approach should be uh, similar to any American family. And unfortunately, there's some people around here who don't seem to understand that, that we need to approach this as a family approaches it and don't place all of the burden on the vulnerable, not placing all the burden on children, older citizens, and those who sometimes don't have a voice in Washington. Mr. President, I would yield the floor. Senator from Arizona. 